Namaskar. On behalf of India Science and the Department of Science and Technology, I, Nidhi Kumar, extend a very warm welcome to you on this, our inaugural program, the Golden Jubilee Inaugural for the Department of Science and Technology, which is presented by the National Council for Science and Technology Communications and Vigyan Prasad. Bharat Vigyan Vibhag ki or se, humare pachas varsho ke is uthakan samaro mein, aap sabhi ka hardik swagat aur abhinandan. Tam so mark jo tirkame. Let us begin today's auspicious event with the praise of the most benevolent and the most merciful God. O light of exceptional glory, enlighten the darkness of our minds, for dark is the path. And thou holdest the light. जैसा कि हम सभी जानते हैं, किसी भी कार्यक्रम का शुभ आरंभ हम दीप प्रज्वलन से करते हैं. I request all our esteemed dignitaries to light the lamp of knowledge. शत्रुबुद्धि विनाशाय दीपज्योतिर नमोस्तुते दीपज्योतिर नमोस्तुते शुभं पुरुषं कल्याणं आरोग्यं धनसं वजह शुभं पुरुषं कल्याणं आरोग्यं धनसं वजह and after that absolutely wonderful and euphonious Lamp lighting uh, ceremony. Thank you so much, sir. Let's talk a little bit of the Department of Science and Technology. <clears throat> this department plays a pivotal role in the promotion of science and technology in the country. The Department of Science and Technology is observing its Golden Jubilee commemoration year during the period 3rd of May 2020 to 2nd of May 2021 with activities like lecture series. Huge events, bringing out publications, documentaries, etc. Today, we talk about the vision, the implementation, the coordination, and the integration in the areas of science and technology and the milestones achieved so far. This will provide a further prep to this 50 year old institution to achieve further grandeur. Today's event is a small celebration of inaugurating the new and small steps that we have taken towards spreading scientific temper in the country. Remembering 50 years of the Department of Science and Technology and what has been its journey, the challenges, the numerous achievements and the enormous success. But before we begin all of that, we are very privileged to have with us today, Dr. Manoj Kumar Pataria, advisor and head of NCSTC. <coughs> Namaste, sir, and welcome. We request you to share your inspiring thoughts and welcome our guests. To make this occasion come alive in its relevance and importance. We welcome you, sir. Very good morning, all of you, on this auspicious occasion of uh, Golden Jubilee year of the Department of Science and Technology. Most respected Professor uh, V.S. Ramamurthy ji, most respected uh, Dr. T. Ramasamy ji, most respected Professor Vijay Raghavan ji, who has just joined, most respected uh, Professor Astro Sharma ji, Secretary of Department of Science and Technology, all my colleagues in DST, uh, Vigyan Prasar, all scientific fraternity, inside science, uh, inside DST, outside DST, all fellows, scholars, students, and dear participants. It's my privilege and pleasure to be able to welcome the leaders of science and technology in India and the leaders of the Department of Science and Technology who have been leading the department for uh, more than three, four decades. As I recall that out of 50 years, something like three decades, I have been in DST. And from my experience, I can say with proud, with a lot of pride that Sare uh, se Acha DST Hamara because for one reason, because this organization, though it is small, uh, but offers 
a very huge impact all around the country and beyond the country. And one important thing I wish to share that uh, whatever you think, whatever you ideate, you can implement that. So this kind of liberty, this kind of freedom, this department offers. And that really a wonderful uh, attribute of the department. Uh, the department is also known for doing science, promotion of doing science, promotion of managing science, as well as promotion of connecting science. It offers a huge connectivity uh, uh, within all cross sections of the society. So on this uh, uh, note, I once again welcome one and all on this very important occasion when we are organizing, we are uh, starting the DST Golden Jubilee Discourse Series under which we have planned one panel discussion and one lecture every month. To begin with, today's this panel discussion where all these luminaries of DST are participating as uh, panelists, moderated by Professor Astur Sharma, the Secretary, Department of Science and Technology, on remembering 50 years of Department of Science and Technology. Uh, with these words, I welcome one and all once again. Thank you. Namaste. Jai Hind. Thank you so much, sir, for those absolutely inspiring words. Jaisa ki aapne kaha, sare jahan se achcha DST hamara bilkul aur evatan matan mere abad rahe tu. Iske saath hi now it is my privilege to welcome our esteemed panelists. It is my pleasure to welcome today Professor Ashutosh Sharma, Secretary, Department of Science and Technology. He is the founding coordinator of the Department of Science and Technology Thematic Unit of Excellence on Soft Nano Fabrication and Chairman of Science of Center for Environmental Science. He is the recipient of many awards and honors, including the Infosys Prize in Engineering and Computer Science and the Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Prize. He has helped initiate several new programs related to infrastructure and human capacity building, innovation and startups, R&D, in advanced manufacturing, waste processing, clean energy, cyber physical systems, industry, academia, cooperation, science communication, women scientists, and major international collaborations in the areas for the priority of the nation. We welcome you, sir. I now extend a very warm welcome to Professor V. S. Ramamurthy. He was the Secretary of Science. Uh, Department of Science and Technology from 1995 to 2006. He is a former director and incumbent emeritus professor of the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. He is a former chairman of the Recruitment and Assessment Board of CSIR and has served as a member of the design team of the first nuclear experiment in Pokhran in 1974. He has also been conferred with the Padma Bhushan in 2005. He is a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy and an elected member of the Indian Academy of Sciences. We welcome you, sir. It is now my honor to welcome today amidst us Dr. T. Ramasamy. He is the former Secretary of Indian Science and Technology from 2006 to 2014. He served as the Director of the Central Leather Research Institute he was awarded the Padma Shri for Excellence in Science and Engineering in 2001 and Padma Bhushan in 2014. He was awarded the Shanti Swaroop Bhattagar Award, the highest award for science in India for notable and outstanding research in chemical sciences in 1993. Bhat Swagat Aptasar, we welcome you. It is now my pleasure and privilege to welcome amidst us Dr. K. Vijay Raghavan. He is the principal scientific advisor to the Prime Minister, Government of India. He is also a fellow of the Royal Society and also a foreign associate of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. He is also a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy. He was the secretary DBT from 2013 to 2018. He has also been conferred to the Shri in 2013 by the Government of India and is also a recipient of the Shanti Swaroop Bhattagar Award, the highest award for science in India in 1998 for his monumental efforts. 
वी वेलकम यू सर आपका स्वागत है एंड नाउ इट गिव्स मी इमेंस डिलाइट एंड प्रिविलेज टू वेलकम प्रोफेसर आशुतोष शर्मा to share his vision and the milestones achieved so far of the department of science and technology thank you sir good morning namaskar it's so delightful that we are kick starting this uh, 50th uh, golden jubilee consultative series for dst uh, and so it's a special pleasure and privilege that we have with us today uh three former secretaries of dst uh, dr v s rama murthy dr t raswami and dr vijay raghavan among three of them they have um they cover more than two decades of dst's evolution uh, out of 50 years uh, unfortunately professor rama rao who was then the former secretary before uh, professor rama murthy uh, could not be with us today but we would get the uh, the benefit of his insights and experience and advice on another day so 50th year uh, is uh, indeed a landmark in any organization's uh, history um, and this uh, the establishment of dst was indeed a turning point for science technology and innovation in india um, because dst uh, connects with the largest stakeholder base of science technology in the country uh, that's all the way from school students to phd to postdoc to young scientists uh, to experienced scientists r and d labs universities iits icers colleges uh, farmers artisans women scientists uh, international connects and so on so it, it's really a very 360 degree connect uh, to the science and technology knowledge ecosystem in the country uh and clearly uh, dst uh, has been built on very uh, deep and solid foundations and for that um people who have served here including the leadership that is with us uh, today uh, have been uh, have been responsible for that um there have been many great uh, structures that have been established Uh, in the last 25 years even 30 years and so on uh, just to count some of them uh, technology development board which is responsible uh, for commercializing indigenous technology by supporting our companies uh, inspire program uh, that is a very holistic a very uh, permeating program which goes all the way from school students uh, to to science uh, students uh to phd uh to faculty level as well so um uh, this this sets up the entire pipeline uh, if you word for science and technology uh, among the most brilliant the most chosen uh, of our people and then the science and engineering research board uh, which is fashioned after uh, the national uh, research foundation of us uh, about 90% of its structure processes architecture and this has been really transformative because we have been able to reach out uh, to very large number of our scientists and empower them uh, with infrastructure uh, with human resources uh, with knowledge and with connect uh, in order to take our science forward i just want to quickly share with you uh, for example uh, that this empowerment is reflected uh, partially in the fact uh that uh, the nature index uh, report last year uh, ranked india number 3 in the number of scientific publications uh, of course that there have been many uh, changes globally the winds of change and the future in science and technology has been coming at us at ever faster and faster rate uh, some of those changes uh, are going to be reflected in the science technology and innovation policy 2020 uh which is uh, under process uh, right now uh it's uh, also being driven uh, by the office of principal scientific advisor who is with us today uh, dr vijay raghavan so of course he continues to aid in the growth of dst uh today uh, as well as in the past uh, that in between he had the additional charge of dst um so as the times are changing uh 
um, DST, like all institutions, uh, strikes a balance between uh, the, the change in continuity, uh, the, the very solid and deep foundations that we build upon today, uh, uh, you know, all the, all the infrastructure, all the human resources that have built over several decades, over five decades, uh, they all continue to aid us even today. Uh, they are reflected in the fact that in the times of COVID-19, uh, one were able to activate a lot of this infrastructure and human resources and knowledge base uh, with speed and scale. Um, just to give you an example, uh, we hear a lot about Bharat Biotech now developing scene. Uh, its success, uh, in fact, its establishment partly was responsible because of the technology development board's uh, support of his original vaccine uh, project. Uh, so there are very many stories. There are thousands, tens of thousands of success stories that have been built upon by the schemes, by the programs, by the policies, by the vision and the support uh, obtained uh, through various arms of DST over the years. Uh, we have been fortunate that the budget uh, starting 2014, 15 and beyond has nearly doubled. Uh, what that meant is that we could keep all the deep foundations and build some more on them, uh, keeping in mind uh, the changes which are happening globally. Uh, some of these directions are enhancing uh, our connect of science to technology, uh, developing technology, connecting technology in academia to industry, uh, to MSMEs, to startups. Uh, the budget for innovation and startups, for example, has gone up 500% in the last five years, uh, basically creating an end-to-end -end innovation ecosystem, the chain, uh, which caters everything from scouting, mentoring, training, uh, to prototyping, uh, to design, to business model, to seed funding, and exit plans. Um, uh, so uh, in terms of technology programs, um, it's uh, looking at the national priorities in manufacturing, in waste processing, in clean energy, in climate, in environment, and so on. Uh, we, of course, have to be clearly future ready. Um, historically, uh, when we are looking at the future, we are looking at disruptive technologies, we are looking at exponential technologies. India has been a little bit slow in waking up to the potential. Uh, and often we may have been a little bit subcritical in our approach uh, to the future. Uh, a great example is semiconductor processing for which we did miss the bus. Uh, so while so there are new programs being seeded, last year there was a mission on cyber physical systems at an investment of 3,660 crores. A new uh, mission uh, also championed by uh, PSA and by Niti Aayog, uh, implemented by DST, uh, is on quantum technologies, uh, which was announced in the last budget at an investment of 8,000 crores, very ambitious mission. All of these missions now would be uh, in, in a triple helix uh, uh, structure or the mode, which means industry, line ministries, and academia, R&D, working together in a seamless way uh, from the beginning as equal stakeholders. Uh, so I haven't any doubt that many of these technologies of future uh, would take a greater root Another two examples coming up are in electric mobility, electric vehicle technologies, uh, and, and another program which started 2015 uh, is National Supercomputing Mission at investment of 4,500 crores. Uh, and I'm happy to report that uh, now these supercomputer design and assembling, et cetera, anything beyond the chip manufacturing is happening in India. Um, there have been several other programs. There have been emphasis on science communication at every level. There have been a new programs in SERB. Uh, the budget of SERB has also more than doubled uh, since 2014-15 timeline uh, so that we are able to keep all the basic science programs and add a few more layers to it. For example, another basic science, applied science program called SUPRA, uh, which allows people to work on high-risk problems uh, the problems that, if successful, would lead to more profound insights rather than incremental changes. Um, there is another program called Vajra, in which we invite uh, the top uh, scientists 
and signs to India to set up a shop here. We spent three months and a year every year, but continue their long distance collaboration as well as continue to co-guide PhD students. We certainly today have the confidence and infrastructure to get the best of science and scientists to India. Uh, unlike, you know, our scientists have been going out for a century now, which is very good. And we bring back uh, all the all the insights uh, and the structures of science by doing that. Uh, but, but also at the same time, we must also have the reverse process uh, in which um, the global science and scientists are making deep uh, roots here in India. Uh, I would just conclude very quickly uh, by saying that uh, the Survey of India, which is a 252-year-old organization uh, today, uh, has gotten into uh, a new technology mode. So what they are doing now is they are making use of sensors, LIDAR, uh, they are making use of drones. Uh, they are doing digital mapping, fully digital mapping uh, with an accuracy resolution of 10 centimeters. Uh, and this is going to be transformative uh, for, for governance, for development, for planning. Uh, and it uh, closely ties in with uh, uh, a very compelling scheme uh, announced by Honorable Prime Minister called uh, Samitwa, uh, which means everybody should know what their land holdings are, what are the land records going down to cadastral level, uh, to gram panchayat level. And so that would indeed be uh, hugely, hugely transformative for everything that we do in the country. And, and finally, uh, we all know, uh, I'm very happy to report to all my seniors uh, that the DST building that we have been sitting in, uh, which is more than 50 years old, and it was uh, actually a warehouse uh, for the American grain. Uh, of course, that has been doing well. It has been, uh, you know, has been uh, remodeled and everything. But now we have the entire new DST campus uh, that should be ready in about three months, uh, which would present the modern face of science and technology in India. Uh, and all the autonomous institutes of DST around Delhi would all be consolidated here. Uh, so I would uh, you know, invite, we'll invite all the stakeholders, science, technology, uh, perhaps early next year uh, for uh, a look uh, at the new uh, phase of science, uh, at least in DST um, and going forward. So these are some of the things uh, which have been happening uh, in last six years. Uh, we are indeed, will ever be grateful uh, to all the pioneers of DST uh, to got us where we are today. Uh, to have this uh, uh, foundation, to have this architecture, to have this great building, the edifice uh, on which we continue to improvise. Uh, sirs, uh, we are indeed very grateful to all three of you who are here with us today. Thank you very much. sir, for sharing the roadmap and the futurology of the Department of Science and Technology and the phenomenal uh, Ji, vision. Please come, uh, um, Please come in and uh, continue the program. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for sharing the roadmap and the vision and the phenomenal vision that you've laid out uh, for the Department of Science and Technology. I remember here one thing, I mean, when we do this, 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 how it is in our country. You have told us how it is in DST, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for uh, sharing uh, the transformation and, and the kind of, uh, you, you also spoke about the hits and misses. Thank you so much, sir. And now request Professor Ramamurthy ji, former director and, uh, and professor of the National Institute of Advanced Sciences to take us back across memory lane and enlighten us on what would be your future as you see it, your vision of Department of Science and Technology. Professor Ramamurthy ji. Thank you, Didi. Well, I'm very happy to be here with you all today to share my memories of DST, my days in DST, and also my expectation from the department in the coming years. I entered the portal of DST in mid-1995. As many of you know, that 1990s were very trying times from the, for the country as a whole. We were still under the technology embargo, the 1974 Pokhran uh, leftover, and uh, the opening of the Indian economy in 1991 
had put a tremendous uh, pressure on our Indian industries in terms of uh, uh, competitiveness. And uh, there was an uh, apprehension across the country whether we can, in fact, uh, do it. And um, um, we, we had two lessons which we could not forget from our uh, pre-1991 days. Now, pre-1991, we were surviving on uh, reverse engineering, we were surviving on uh, license manufacture and all. We know very well 90s after the opening up, it, it will not work. But there were still some lessons which we uh, which were very relevant and which we could not forget. Number one is there is no substitute for individuals, whether they are researchers, whether they are engineers, whether they are technicians. Ultimately, it is the human brain which wins. The second thing uh, is that um, never have a situation that you give up. The no give up under any circumstance was a motto of those years. So our successes in uh, the, uh, the denied technologies in uh, nuclear or whether it is in parallel processing computers or in several other technology uh, sectors, it was this uh, doggedness which kept the country uh, alive and floating. And we realized that this is continued, this will continue in the uh, days following the opening of the economy also. The Department of Science and Technology and my, under my uh, predecessor, uh, Professor Ram Rao, were, uh, were very much aware of this. Ram Rao also comes from the defense uh, research segment and has experienced the technology denial regime in, in, person, in person. And uh, he had a roadmap for Department of Science and Technology, which put emphasis on training of people in the development of technologies and in uh, taking it forward into the commercial uh, space. I had, yeah, my job was cut out. There was already a roadmap and I had to only follow the roadmap as much as possible. And that's what I did. Some other things were already referred to by uh, Sarmaji. The Science and Engineering Research Council had a major mandate of uh, promoting R&D and promoting uh, researchers in the country to do cutting edge research. And uh, what we what we did, some of the things were proven uh, scientists, people with a track record, should be encouraged to move further. And one of the things which I uh, distinctly remember was the uh, Swarnajayanti fellowships, which were uh, introduced, uh, introduced at that time. And uh, in fact, there was one professor, Atutosh Sharma, uh, who was uh, with the first batch of uh, uh, Swarna Jayanti fellowships and uh, subsequently I came to know that he was last somewhere in the jungles of uh, New Delhi and I was happy to see him again today on the screen. So he, there are many batches after 1997-98 uh, till today several uh, groups of people who have been uh, selected and supported. Basic idea is that uh, send out a message if you deliver you get supported. And we had the JC Post uh, fellowships for uh, scientists with uh, proven uh, track records. And then we had the Kishore Vaigani for people with, uh, in these schools uh, who, have the, who display the potential to do it. And I'm very glad that uh, after I uh, came out and Ramsami came in, he said, no, this scale will not do. Uh, for this country, uh, it has to be scaled up. And he scaled it up like anything, uh, the uh, program which he put in. Uh, for the training of young students and carrying it forward is, is something which is uh, probably uh, have, the world has never seen that scale in terms of number, in terms of scope and in terms of uh, the methodologies which were adopted to train them, to nurture them, to mentor them. The whole system was there. So I'm very happy that this is happening. And uh, the other thing which were there is technology development. Uh, Professor Sharma already mentioned about the uh, technology development board, which supported uh, Bharat Biotech from scratch to establish Sata Biotech, Bharat Biotech. We, we got into vaccine development to modern, through modern methods only with the support of the technology development board. And, and today they are com competing at the international level. So these are seeds were shown at, shown at that time and we are reaping the harvest now. And uh, there are many programs uh, where the Technology Development Board has uh, uh, supported young uh, entrepreneurs. 
the technology uh, entrepreneurship parts have always been there but we there is a number one scale was low it was confined to educational institutions we established the first technology business incubators outside the uh, educational institutions alone and the other day i was reading professor sharma making a statement that this year we will have 100 more such incubators that's a scale in which uh, we, uh, we will uh, we would like to move and i'm very happy that that program is really going up very fast there, uh, there was mention of uh, science communication the other thing which comes to my mind is during those years preceding those years uh, collaboration with other countries means a donor recipient relation uh, we are poor and we would like to have some help in terms of science technology money whatever it is it's a donor recipient relation that changed completely in the 90s we said no we are no longer interested in donor recipient relationship we will work on equal partnership whether it is the united states or france or russia or any one of those countries developed countries it was equal sharing we we put in the money you put in the money we are interested in the program you are interested in the program there is an overlap of interest and our scientists and your scientists will work we will share the, the ip ip will not belong to only to you or to me it will be shared by us uh, this is a major change in our international relations it also gives the confidence into to participate in international mega science projects like CERN, mega technology projects like ITEP, right we have never heard that kind of investment by india in uh, futuristic projects which we did and our our scientists have delivered you must have seen either um, uh, the first step of the crust uh, the entire components were made in india uh, moved over to the uh, site and they are already under construction right so it, it gave us a new confidence that we are we are ready to compete with you we are ready to share our successes we are ready to take the risk but we are not going to go to you with a uh, with a um, hand for uh, for science. please help us no that's that's not the spirit in which we will cooperate in science and technology uh Sarmati mentioned about uh, uh, the building yes the dsd building as it exists today was a leftover of the pl480 build uh, periods but i'm very glad that we will be moving out of it and dsd will be in a building of its own this this sort of reflects the spirit of DST uh, today, and uh, I will I, I will have uh, one uh, one uh, one thought which we have not still committed, which we have not progressed in my before I conclude. You know the number of R and D personnel in this country per billion population is still far below that of the developed countries. We are even below that in China. China has uh, four or five times more number of R&D professionals per million population as compared to India. This cannot go on. We, we must have enough number of scientists, enough number of technologies, enough number of entrepreneurs, which is consistent with our population. After all, we are a country of 1.3 billion people and our R&D efforts, R&D, manpower, R&D investments, everything should be proportional to that number, which it is not. And it has been shown by, by many countries before, if you invest, you get back the return. There are always a feel, but we don't have enough money. No, it is putting the cart before the horse. You invest, you will get the money for the next investment. Uh, the China has shown it, other countries like Korea has shown it, many other countries have shown it. And I think we should we should move into that. Our our target should be we are not going to have a, a small number of people per million population. We will have a number which is consistent with our population. Of course, uh, uh, COVID-19 has shown us that uh, our um, our technological strengths uh, come up to life and deliver when there is a need. I, I still remember. Uh, 20 years before, DST supported a program to handle plastic waste and, plastic and hospital waste using plasma incineration technologies. We had put some instruments, uh, some units in Andaman, uh, some units in the Himalayan uh, uh, areas 
where there is a lot of plastic and we have to get rid of that. We, we, we use this technology to part of that. Today, the technology is certified for hospital waste. COVID-19 has said very clearly that if you do not handle hospital waste properly, we are going to be in more trouble. Unfortunately, we don't have a national program to handle hospital waste. In fact, we don't have a national program to handle waste, whether it is municipal waste, whether it is municipal uh, water, uh, waste water. Uh, the, the technologies for handling these things exist. We have a major stake in it. If you do not handle it properly, we will be laying down invitations to disasters like COVID-19. We have the technologies already developed. Most of them supported by uh, DST or other agencies. It doesn't matter who supported it. But we are not implemented as a national program. So we have to uh, set aside national priorities and uh, road, set a roadmap and do it. We can do it. My, my experience in DST and subsequently what I've been seeing in the country, uh, my bottom line is, yes, we can do it. We can deliver it, but we will have to do it. We have to start moving. So uh, already I see a lot of uh, changes which are taking place and uh, this will take us forward also in those directions. I will stop here and I thank uh, Professor Sharma for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts of my days in DSC and subsequently my days outside DSC as suspected. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You have been in the new Bharat and new DST. And you have told the road map. I think Professor Sharma had already answered that. In fact, he had said that we are getting real and taking science to schools and colleges. Unfortunately, we have been a little hampered by the uh, COVID pandemic. Otherwise, the time, the scale, and the way the DST has compressed timelines to take this endeavor forward, this vision of yours forward is again phenomenal. And on that note, I request now Dr. T. Ramasamy uh, to please take us on a nostalgia trip and share his thoughts with us. Thank you, sir. Well, very good morning, Nidhi. Very, very good. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Of course, as was pointed out, it's a sharing of a memory lane. And I see some friends of mine from a long distance, and uh, this occasion has made it even more, uh, let me say, nostalgic and emotional. As someone who had been part of this country's uh, changing India in the science concept for many years, I would like to locate DST in the larger aspect of things and look at DST alone. If we're looking at the public policy support for the Indian government to Indian science, that's always been total. Even before DSC was formed, this commitment of the country to invest into science was been total. India is one of the few countries as early as 1958, talked about scientific policy resolution for a developing country. Of course, uh, it was 1971 when the 3rd of May, they decided to have a Department of Science and Technology. India is the only country which has in its constitutional responsibility for citizens, scientific temper. So the investment of the Indian government and Indian civilization, if I'm going to use the terminology civilization, so science has been completely there. So the Department of Science and Technology's role was in, an, in a way carried out already through a constitutional process and the kind of commitments that the society government, successive governments have shown. But when in 1971, when India set up this Department of Science and Technology, I would say that uh, it was a small budget, some four crores or something. So it's a catalyst. I remember being talked to on the 4th of May, 19, 2006, which was a day after the foundation day of the department. And I was asked what the ASC would differ. How would it change in the 2006 journey? 
I said, if you're a catalyst as a chemist, you know it's reactive. It's also non-participative. The Department of Science and Technology will have to change its character from this uh, reactive state to proactive state, from non-participative to participative state. See, it's not about how many different things that we have done, but lots of different things have been done in manners which are different and it mattered to this country all along. And I am mightily pleased that in the journey of 50 years, India has seen that Indian science has come of ages. And I am very happy when Sharma, Dr. Sharma pointed out that in the number of publications, we have moved up the international ranking systems. Long, long ago, it was 15th. Now we are looking at in the top five. So fundamentally, what Indian science has shown is that the, uh, if you invest, you do give return to this country. Some of us who have been part of this uh, panel belong to a generation of scientists who did not have the kinds of uh, support system that is available to a scientist today. That has happened because of the India's support to science and Department of Science and Technology playing the role of a sheet anchor. I remember the day uh, when I had to speak for the 11th plan of India uh, in DSC's investment. I said DSC is like a yeah, The essentiality of it is by recognized by its absence. If we don't have oxygen, we drop dead. But we never thank oxygen. Department of Science and Technology has played the role of the pranavayu, or the oxygen for the Indian science system all along. And uh, I'm not speaking only from the point of view of somebody who serves the secretary, even the scientists working in this country, all of us know that Department of Science and Technology was essentially an advocacy uh, unit of the scientists within the government. I'm very happy that in the last uh, 50 years, lots of good things are happening. I congratulate Dr. Sharma for uh, taking the Department of Science and Technology to the newer uh, aspects of uh, development process in the country. Ultimately, a nation invests into science for, the well, for improving the welfare of citizens. We must all remember that. It is not that the... Uh, the science to be celebrated by scientists. Science to be celebrated by citizens of the country is very important. And in this, one must say that uh, compared to many other countries which have gone into what we call a high resource intense programs, they have uh, they put a lot of money, they got a lot of things, fine. But you go back and ask this question. If American investment into per scientists were to happen, Per scientist, investment of let's say $332,000 per scientist. And that had to supply a global population 7.5 billion. <laughs> the total investment of the world per year should be $9.3 trillion. Today's global investment is $1.8 trillion. What we are talking about today, if if the the so-called American investments are the even the Chinese investments per scientist and the number of scientists were to happen, if you have to have a 7.5 billion population preserved by science and scientific research, the global investments that are happening today on purchase power parity terms is at least at least. 40%, 50% lower than necessary. Now, why am I presenting this? The Ministry of Science and Technology, as led by Dr. Sharma today and Dr. Jaragu today, have a need to look at this opportunity that India presents to pre yeah, give a completely yeah, a new SNP policy framework where there's a low resource setting is not a disadvantage. It is an advantage for increasing the, the scientific results reaching 
unserved underserved people of the world and that all that can happen if department of science and technology were to now look at the manners of advocacy for right sizing the full time equivalent scientists of this billion million population my predecessor dr ramamurthy pointed out very strongly that we have far fewer scientists than what we need to serve this country but it is an opportunity for us when the 2020 uh, scip is being formulated that we need to have a right size what is the size of the number of science full time equivalent for serving the indian population necessary the next question here scientists have to also undergo some transformation they cannot think the responsibility of uh, uh, dst is to make money available for them to do what they want to do science dst has played a role and presenting to the government the what is science good for what is good for science has been spoken about before but today we need to go back and ask what is science good for what is good for science we have done but what is science good for is a question and therefore and i believe that uh, the new uh, vision the, the department would need to do is to really make the indian science be celebrated by the citizens of this country not just the scientists of the country alone and we have published education is important technology is important we have we have to be self reliant above all if you are to go back and ask a common man in the city, in the streets of delhi how would that person relate the life of that system to the indian science contribution it be something in non descript they say you have done a great job i think scientists also have to be told that by the department of science and technology that we should become a prime mover in the mindset of india that we are there for citizens thank you very much thank you thank very you much thank you so again. much sir thank you um there is a little lag uh, i'm sorry about that thank you sir thank you thank you thank you for your very very inspiring words like you said uh, we are indeed catalyzing change and we are looking at dialogue and bringing in more awareness and uh, taking this uh, institution to greater and newer heights aapne ek baat kahi aur mujhe yaad aayi aatmanirbhar bharat ki A poet once said, and he was a Victorian poet, mind you, and one of my favorites, Robert Browning. A man's life must always reach out and uh, be more than his grasp of what's the heaven for. And with these lines, I now request the very honourable Dr. K. Vijay Raghavan, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Prime Minister, Government of India, to share the key takeaways of the past 50 years and the roadmap for the future. Uh, thank you very much, Nidhi. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today and uh, speak after my eminent colleagues, uh, Dr. Ramurthy, Dr. Ramasamy, and uh, Dr. Ashutosh Sharma. Um, they have covered really everything that needs to be said. Uh, Ashutosh was generous in. saying that you know uh, between the three of us we cover uh, a huge uh, span of dst's history but my uh, contribution in terms of time uh, is only a few minutes uh, in that span compared to the decades which the others have put in but nevertheless dst uh, even in the brief period i was there uh, and before and after has always been very close to my heart both for the extraordinary talent and professionalism of all of dst's scientists administration and finance people but also because of the extraordinary impact uh, dst has on our ecosystem um amongst all our science agencies uh, and indeed amongst all our ministries dst's reach and uh, span and depth required in every area is so much that it is truly the agency 
for transformation of India uh, and not uh, through science and technology, but its impact will be enormous. There are some few important points uh, relevant to what I will uh, now address, which I'd like to recapitulate from what Dr. Ramaswamy said and what Dr. Ramurthy said. It is important, of course, very important to increase the amount of resources we are uh, putting into science and technology. I have no question about that. And it's important to invest in cutting edge areas so that we are not left behind. All that is very true. But it is also important, as Dr. Ramuthi pointed out, that we have a certain self-confidence about what to do and where to go, rather than be stressed out about saying that we are behind in this area or that area and we need to catch up. The approach to catch up is just not a feasible one if you do a rough, even if you do a rough back of the envelope calculations of the kinds of budgets involved and the timelines involved to build the big scientific empires we see today. And therefore the approach to catch up must be doing more for less and using intellectual capacity on how to do that. I'll come to a little later on how that can be done, but it cannot be by mere scaling in a proportionate manner to what others do. It has to be proportionate to our investment, of course. Our percentage GDP investment needs to go up substantially, but we have to see how we can vastly use those resources. In that regard, on the foundations of what um, Dr. Ramurthy, Dr. Ashutoshama, Dr. Ramaswamy have built in terms of broad people oriented programs, uh, we have to see how we can go ahead. Dr. Ramaswamy pointed out another very important factor that we need to get more for less. And if we look at all the bells and whistles of technologies and science which the West has developed, they have been developed over literally hundreds of years in a different cultural context. And therefore, we have to see whether there is room for originality in doing, addressing similar questions of uh, in the various themes of technology in a manner which is much more uh, you know, valuable uh, for us in terms of the kinds of investment we can make. Now, I'll talk to how we can do it on this. But let me point out that in this big investment which the West has made in science and technology, in no small measure has India contributed over historical time and even in a contemporary situation. India's contribution more recently has been enormous. Our undergraduate and graduate support we give for students going abroad, paid by our citizens, is comparable to a petroleum import bill. This has led to Indian intellectuals, scientists, technologists, economists, historians, mathematicians, playing a very important role in the growth of science and technology in the West, which is good. There's nothing wrong in that. But that cannot be the only approach to our human resource, our, our, our talent development. Now, this has led to a great intellectual development in a variety of areas of science and technologies all over the world in which we have participated. But keep in mind that over time, since independence, the landscape of science and technology has changed enormously because of this. At independence and before, excellence in science and technology were random events of talented individuals coming up all over the world. And the extent of the institutions of science and technology were rather small. The footprint of science and technology were small. So talented individuals could accumulate from anywhere at the wall of excellence. Today, the wall of excellence is occupied hugely because of enormous investment over the past several decades. And that wall is dominated by the West, China, and Japan, for example. How then can we have accumulation at that wall of excellence from India uh, is the important question. The answer to that is simple, yet difficult to execute. Today, much of our science and technology funding goes to a small number of institutions 
supported by the central government and a few places supported by state governments or private um, uh, private efforts. Ninety percent of our students, however, go to state universities and affiliated colleges, where research is not a con uh, is not a substantial component of thinking. Research and inquiry and analytical thinking must be a core aspect of every student right from high school, indeed earlier, up to college and beyond. This requires investment of a certain kind, of course enormous resources, but also enormous focus on what one does in every area, history, geography, mathematics, science, technology, chemistry, physics, biology, and so on. This massive effort on scale is different from a focused effort on developing specific areas of science and technology uh, across the spectrum or you know what the DAE does or the DRDO or ISRO or DBT or DST and so on and so forth. So we need a big, big take on this of a scale very different from what is done. And that is why national education policy, which has just been rolled out, proposes the National Research Foundation to have this kind of support across scale in a large way, a combination of public, private, philanthropic support industry to scale the effect of um, science and technology across the country. This is going to be a big challenge. It will take time, but it's all the more reason to start now. Uh, the second component, which uh, we need to take on as a community, where DST has a big role, including other area, uh, including other agencies, is again something which was highlighted by Professor Ramamurthy. He gave the example of waste. If you look around us, the situation regarding waste is something which is very frightening. The Ghazipur waste dump in Delhi is taller than the Taj Mahal and occupies about, about 76 or 77 acres. And there are about 100 such dumps all over the country. My colleagues and I have analyzed this and not only are there these waste dumps, our rivers and canals are extraordinarily polluted and our ongoing systems of collection and dealing with waste need to be fixed. So there are two components to waste, one the legacy issue and one what is happening now. Technologies of course exist all over the world and in India. But the problem is not solely a technological one. It is one of tweaking the technology into an appropriate mechanism in each context, dealing with procurement and other bottlenecks, and having a trained set of people working to um, you know, run the technology perfectly. So in other words, this is a complicated mission. It's as complicated a mission as building and operating some, but in a very different context in a very different distributed manner. It requires the same level of science, technology, and quality, and to assume that this is a low level of task would be wrong. So I would urge our agencies to work together because this is a multi-agency, multi-ministry, state government, municipal cooperation challenge. If this challenge of legacy waste can be addressed and a zero waste structure put together, it would be absolutely extraordinary. The Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council has taken this on as a key mission. There are other missions which we need to take up, which are analogous to what we have taken up in terms of the square kilometer array or the 30 meter telescope or you know uh, the LIGO and so on and so forth. These are necessary and very important big missions and they are big investments. They provide the foundations of our training for our scientists. And my only point about them is by appreciating and seeing the great value, it is now important to increase the human footprint of these projects across the country hugely. CERN, instead of having hundreds of Indian collaborators, must have tens of thousands of Indians who are using that data. So also with the square kilometer array when it comes up, with various telescopes, with LIGO and so on and so forth. In other words, our effort in these areas should be not only to be, you know, equal contributors with the modest amount of resources we put in and training high quality, small numbers of people, but this big data which comes from these missions 
should be accessible to everyone through our training so that in the top 100 high energy physicists or astronomers or astrophysicists, we have you know several Indians over the next few years. So this is an area for the big missions we need to. Simultaneously, our big missions coming on now to deal with these areas which we heard about, waste is one, uh, energy is another, uh, our waterways are the third, and so on. These are all important scientific big time missions which we should deal with. And that's something which VST now can take the lead uh, and make sure that all of us work together in this. Uh, the quantum mission which the VST is pushing is an example again. Um, even though, you know, at its peak would be a quantum computer, at its base would be technology development across the spectrum in photonics, semiconductors, lasers, and so on, uh, and handling of data and computer science, which are essential for that mission. So these missions are not to be viewed only at the tip at the pyramid and what the goals are, but building a capacity enormously, in particularly in this 90% uh, uh, of our student population, which where we don't have a reach. I'd like to end by pointing out the importance of studying our ecosystem. For many, many years, epidemiologists, uh, public health people have been warning about the, exactly this kind of a pandemic. So this pandemic is no surprise at all. There has been a tendency, however, amongst those who look from an economic perspective as the costs of an investment of protection against a potential pandemic are seen as potentially wasteful expenditure. In other words, you have an argument among finance people across the world that the safety belt in a car is not necessary because you don't need it very often. Similarly, shock absorbers may not be necessary because a bumpy road is not there very often, and so on and so forth. You know, airbags are not necessary, safety locks are not necessary. And then you have a pared down motor car, which is functional, but is not prepared for contingency, small and big. It's important to remember that environmental and health catastrophes of the kind we have seen will become more and more frequent. There are two reasons for that. Any low probability event of close contact between animals and humans spilling over to a disease will inevitably happen if you do one of two things or do both. Given enough time, a low probability event will happen. Given enough proximity and intensity of proximity, a low probability event will happen with high probability. We have increased the proximity of contact and intensity of contact between humans and animals to such an extent that such pandemics will only happen again and again. There, is, there are some general solutions to deal with them that we have learned from this pandemic. Those must be implemented on scale. They involve digital contact tracing on scale, which will be useful for any pandemic, and mechanisms of understanding the physical basis of communication of different diseases and therefore isolation of different forms. These two will give digital space and non-pharmaceutical intervention space while we deal with future pandemics in addition to cleaning up our environment, which is important. The other aspect of future disasters relate to climate change. All too often we think that those disasters will come in terms of only rising sea levels or melting glaciers uh, altered climate, climatic conditions and so on. Yes, indeed, those will happen along with increasing temperature. But the consequences on human health of those will be enormous. We live every day with bacteria and viruses and other kinds of bugs, which today are harmless to us. In them, there are genes which potentially, if when activated, can invade other tissues and cause very severe damage. Those silent genes are easily activated by changes in external conditions, much more so than external conditions affect us. The example I'd like to give is about, the, which I've given several times, is the Saiga antelope in Kazakhstan. 
It had commensal bacteria in its nasal passages, which did it no harm. But a 1.5 degree increase in summer temperature made these bacteria invasive and caused sepsis and killed a very large number of these animals. In other words, these kinds of genetic environmental switches can cause severe damage and therefore a fundamental understanding of ecology, evolutionary biology, climate change, and indeed all of science is important. So I'd like to end by saying we have many known and potential challenges from basic to applied science which we have to address. But if you have to, if you have to have the capability of addressing challenges which are unknown to us at this time, the only way is by spreading the footprint of science and technology and critical thinking so that when unknown unknowns hit us, we are able to be truly innovative and smart and deal with them. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Those were indeed very, very thought-provoking and inspiring words. Uh, you spoke about a uh, pandemic, sir, and we cannot really wish away these pandemics, but we have to take them head on. You have been an institution builder and you spoke about the footprint and the large verticals that you mentioned. I'm amazed that we're all looking at uh, so much progress in the years to come. And it reminded me of the lines, uh, you know, the word footprint. I must share them with you. Uh, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing, leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. And I'm sure we'll be scripting history here at the DST or is or better banayenge. I now request uh, Professor Ashutosh Sharma, sir, to please take up a few questions that are flashing on our screens, Q&A from the uh, audience. Uh, Dr. Raghavan, sir, do I have your permission to start the questions, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, certainly. And, and let me just say that uh, the flux of experience and wisdom passing through this last half an hour has been so exceptional, so extraordinary indeed. Uh, and so that uh, I would, of course, request uh, all the three people here, as well as uh, Professor Rama Rao, uh, to continue to supply us uh, advice uh, for going forward on many different things that we discussed, all of them very compelling uh, points that have come across. So, okay, what, so what's question the question you asked? Abhilash Pani uh, of Odisha, he says, how could the Department of Science and Technology inspire Gen Next students and children of the schools and colleges to take more interest? Basically, how we can get the magic uh, across and uh, he's also asked about the program Inspires. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Ramasamy is the architect of that program. And so we would ask him well, to respond to it. Sir, thank you. Thank you, Storch. I, I was only an instrument and not an architect. But uh, I'm very happy this is a question on the manner in which the talent supply of this country can be harnessed to pursue science and research, undertake research as a career. To the best of my knowledge, uh, INSPIRE is some program which has been named as actually, if you look at it in terms of acronym, it says uh, INSPIRE, but innovation in science pursue for INSPIRE research. He talked about research being inspired and science being a pursuit, not a job. I mean, not a career. Science is inspired was truly science as a pursuit and research as inspired. I'm very happy in the last several years because it started in 2008. I understand the number of people who have benefited by it is huge. In terms of number, we are talking about 2 million people plus. I'm aware that when this was commissioned, this project was commissioned, they were saying that talented people were rather spending energy and time to manage innovations than create innovations. How to attract them to do research? Innovation itself, that was an issue. I understand something like 86,000 young people who are top 1% performers of uh, their respective class boards actually undertook this fellowship scheme to become a scientist. And there's even a class of 71 in Kumar 
all the 71 were inspire awardees therefore my personal feeling will be the inspire was like a seed so i'm being the sapling being given some for small amount of energy and food but predominantly the science community of india has won the responsibility of nourishing people mentoring people the most important part is mentoring people into the system and i don't think today people talk about talented people not being attracted to science and they may need to have further levels of investments further levels of mentoring support systems but i think uh, the inspire has begun well and i must compliment one thing uh, there are very few times when we do something in americans copy us it turns out after we started it inspire national science foundation started inspire and that and in that inspire was national science foundation so inspire was in that sense the process which created upwelling and i hope that aso sharma's uh, care will take them to really contribute to the country's development thank you thank you sir and i hope abhilash you got your answer abhilash pani of odisha our next question has come from sara smriti from delhi who has written to ask us what role does csd play in societal development and the prospective of innovation and technology at the state level ashutosh sir if you can take this and also she is asking if there are any grants given for uh, making apps if so way to inquire yeah so so let me first say conclude about the inspire program that this has inspired not only our students and scientists but indeed inspired the global community including the national science foundation so it's been it has had a very tremendous impact i have met thousands hundreds of these people and addressed them and interacted with them it has had uh, actually a very profound influence on on each of these lives going forward in the journey of science and uh, now uh, the second point uh, was let me also complete uh, the story about uh, inspire journey now inspire uh, you know so it takes you all the way from school to college to phd uh, and preparation for faculty jobs uh, one of the things that have been missing in our ecosystem uh, is the lack uh, of a national level program in post doctoral fellowships uh, in in great numbers Uh, because there is a very huge gap after PhD. That the point is, if you don't get a job right after PhD, which is nearly impossible in academia, uh, etc., uh, then a whole lot of people are looking for opportunities elsewhere. Uh, uh, and so now that there is a program called National Postdoctoral Fellowship, uh, which just addresses that little gap between PhD and a scientist. Uh, there are about three thousand postdoctoral fellows in the country supported by science and engineering research board so you take all the top people coming out of phd pipeline who are preparing themselves uh, for a career in science and r and d and so on uh, so that gap has been indeed uh, been filled uh, quite well at the moment uh, the question was about the societal impact of science and technology and especially going to states this has indeed been a uh, been a huge question Uh, and in fact yesterday uh, minister of science and technology who is also minister of health and family welfare and earth sciences in fact uh, we are planning to have a meeting uh, tomorrow uh, with uh, all the ministers uh, of science technology from different states and in fact the idea is well how do we connect even more strongly uh, our science and technology with the states is fairly clear that every state has local problems that are looking for solutions through science technology and innovation and uh, not not uh, india is a diverse country so while we do uh, theory of relativity and quantum mechanics at the same time we also do uh, solve problems uh, which are of local nature uh, so indeed the whole idea and there would be a big chapter in the science technology policy on this uh, is how do we work more closely more strongly in the partnership mode uh, with the states uh, there are connects now uh, and those connects need to be uh, scaled up fully uh, to to bring in the true sense of ownership and partnership uh, with the states uh, now it happens through other mechanisms of course uh, dst's uh, support for science and technology is agnostic to who is asking for it as long as they are relevant 
as long as they are competitive. So a whole lot of funding does go to state, uh, you know, organizations, universities, uh, their labs and so on. Um, and, and of course, that we seek solutions which would be applicable uh, to the states. There are state SNT councils. This has been a mechanism uh, which has been uh, in place uh, for, for a very long time. Uh, so now we are also making sure that the connect of the state councils to the state government is also uh, strong. So this is not just connect of DST with the state councils, which could be strong, but also the connect of state uh, SNT councils to the state government uh, as an intermediate stakeholders uh, of this process. So I think we uh, people are fully, uh, uh, you know, understanding of the dimensions of this problem, and then how do we need to take it forward? Uh, and, and I think that the policy coming up now would provide some comprehensive solutions uh, to this problem uh, as well. Uh, of course, there is also a connect with the society at large. So that is through different programs of DST. Uh, so a whole lot of that happens through NGOs, that happens through state machinery, and all of that provides another pathway uh, of connect to uh, working with the states. You know, one of the questions uh, that uh, I'm sure somebody is asking you and we are often asked, and this was touched upon also by uh, uh, Dr. Rama Murthy and Dr. Rama Swami and indeed Dr. Vijay Raghavan. The problem is, look, when we are so good at science and technology, we got deep strengths, right, which is reflected, for example, in our being number three in the world in number of scientific publications. So the question, obvious question, which is a very... Uh, mm -hmm. a very relevant questions, if we would, is a, how come we don't see that strength reflected uh, in our industry? We import a whole lot of technology, right? whether it's biomedical instruments, uh, whether it is anything, right? We, we, do, we do that. So now with this uh, thing about Atmanirbha Bharat, uh, clearly, what is it that we are missing? So while we have deep strengths in science and technology, why is it that we don't see it in action all the time, right around me? And it's a very uh, valid question, if you would. O only issue is that uh, we, uh, there was another thing which was pointed out that number of scientists per million per capita are rather small in India compared to its neighbors and other people. Actually, these two problems are very hugely interrelated. So I would, uh, you know, ask this uh, to, to all uh, the people here. Uh, former secretaries of DST, yeah. that if we were to increase, uh, for example, uh, the number of our PhD students who then become scientists and increase the per capita, right? It's a very curious situation. See that the industry has to participate uh, in making use of knowledge that we create. Uh, indeed, to absorb all these PhDs. I think there is a bit of lag. Uh, I'm really sorry about that, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, so I stop there since there's a leg. Let's uh, shake a leg or two uh, and go ahead with that, right? So we were doing that. Anyway, I've been speaking too much. Uh, so uh, I would just very quickly uh, you know, pose the question saying that, look, coming from the industry side, not coming from academic side or side of academia, how do we fix their participation in R&D and to make use of knowledge and, uh, and structures that we already have? Uh, and that indeed would mean that we can create more PhD students who would actually find job in our industrial knowledge system. Uh, there's, a, there's a question I'm asking on behalf of the entire scientific community and indi indeed the entire nation. So, uh, Pro uh, Professor Ramamurthy perhaps uh, could start on that. I... Well, I, I, I don't have a ready-made answer for this. The point is, it's a question of mutual confidence. If you ask an industrialist, he will say, okay, the scientific community will give halfway through and then we give up. Uh, I remember one case, there was a process, chemical process, which was from an, uh, a government institution. And that was a huge industrial opportunity. Industry came to Technology Development Board. We gave the money when they set up the project and uh, it was inaugurated by me. And then they said that the efficiency, which was supposed to be about 90 plus percentage, 
is not more than 75 which is not financially viable now what do i do they said no go back to the institution and tell them you are at the lab scale it is 95 but in the industrial scale it is only 75 what should we do he went back to the institution and then there was a fight between the scientists and the director in the institution and you know what happened so this fellow had to close the institute uh, the industry when we closed the industry the technology development board was on him to get back the money from him and for <laughs> almost 3 years he was running from liar to liar to get out of that mess right so in other words every every component of this chain had some weakness or other that is what we have to we have to correct now we understand we try our best but uh, there is no magic solution I, i think that is where our uh, problem is we, we, will, we will we are making progress in that uh, we will continue to make progress but not fast enough we have to make it faster perhaps dr rama sami has uh, some con- uh, to contribute hi right, uh, thank you uh, stores unlike my predecessors who came from defense departments who had the protection of the government who invested in it and they made technology their users so by the by the government for the government to the government i came from a char- the yeah, chamda institute leather institute remember mm-hmm. here i when people talk about this problem mm-hmm. i did not see it as a problem because at that time when i came to the department of science and technology i was the director of the leather research institute and 48% of my money came from industry and that was not for love of your work if if industry would put money into research the research has to provide affordable and viable solutions i short of that you cannot wish people to invest it turned out that the central leather research institute was in a position to provide viable on ground solutions to the problems and therefore as somebody if i had continued along that institute in fact there was a time i could have taken that institute completely out of the government funding there no need for a government funding as far as that institute was concerned but what happens is in our peer review system we look at some of these as if not great science science is to be not value only from what uh, vijay talked about the wall of excellence there is a question of relevance there is a question of sustenance the relevance and sustenance is not built into the ethos of scientific education in this country scientific research in this country and our public institutions in research do not promote that fundamentally the idea of the prime minister's doctoral fellowship that we established in the department was essentially bridge that uh, lack of trust that prevails within industry and the research in this country there's a gap the absence of a social capital the trust between the scientists and the industry that was possible to create a system where the project not to be evaluated for its excellence Pro- profit need project in prime minister doctor fellowship was evaluated for the relevance of the industry and there has the choice of the project itself is not to be valued whether you can publish a paper whether or a patent it's about whether it is going to solve a problem so primarily uh, uh, a stores i think we need to see the cultural change a cultural change in which the scientists and the industry people let respect each other trust each other and this technology development board which uh, my predecessor talked about was supposed to be a soft money it is supposed to be a present by where risk of failure of technology is covered risk of enterprises covered but 
on the other hand we convert that art so also into another watchdog if technology development board 70% of the project succeeded we don't worry about the 70% which succeeded we talked about 30% which failed and put that follows what then the technology development board mistakes in this country if it is going to be punished if the risk is not a big system please forget this this will not happen the 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 concept of uh, audit concept of audit for the sake of financial process rather than the value is a mistake as far as the technology that the particular company that uh, 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 ramamurthy spoke about i think it is important that we need to bring about a certain cultural change in our mindset about not punishing a failure of a technology thank you i completely yeah, agree yeah. with ramsam yeah, on this uh, I, i i completely agree with ramsam on this uh, we we have this weakness we forget the 70% success and we try to do the 30% uh, micro management and analysis and more importantly we have lost our capability to distinguish fraud from a failure in scientific research and a failure in the marketplace there are market cannot be always predicted and there could be failure but then you don't penalize the fellow who tried it you only penalize the fellow who was uh, deliberately doing a, a fraud we have lost our capacity to that or no we never had the capacity to do that and i think that is what uh, that's extremely important see ramsamy is an exception he was a scientist he was all the director of the institute he was also part of the industry it doesn't happen all the time right I, and that, that's a chance Right. Yeah, no. I was very lucky trainers. not to have the government mm. support completely for doing science. In indeed, very frank and fair views, and they would go a long way in factoring in as to how we run our business in the future. <laughs> Now, there is one more aspect of this problem. One aspect is industry and academia, government working together. Another aspect is industry itself developing a knowledge ecosystem which is valued. Uh, for their growth and profit and this part is very important because uh, you see globally about 10% phd's uh, find a job directly in academia or some government related structure so therefore you ask yourself if you were to increase number of scientists if you were to increase number of phd student of relevance and quality as well as their absorption in the industry i think this is very critical so uh, why how does industry are uh, going to be on board uh, for this knowledge sector looking at the value that it brings to them i mean e even independent of interaction with the uh, with the government or interaction with the uh, with the academia uh, right so i think this, i i, I pose this question now i think we are nearly at the end and this is a question i'm posing on behalf of all the listeners and people that ask us uh, to professor vijay raghavan <laughs> thank you very much you know i think uh, dr ramaswamy uh, and dr ramamurthy have covered uh, the critical aspects of what is needed for collaboration you raise another matter about industry itself investing in research for industry's benefit as opposed to as distinct from collaborative uh, problem solving the challenge is a simple one you look at the levels of investment by the googles or the ges of the world in r&d their r&d investment each of them exceeds that of the entire us national science foundation so when we are talking about industry having a hunger for investment it is not merely you know in terms of a cultural change which is important it has the same challenges with academic investment in r&d has in how can you invest and industry has capital industry doesn't have risk capital and therefore how does one manage against this huge risk in a globally competitive world it's much more pressing a question for industry and for academia which has the luxury of not having a deadline in terms of reaching a certain uh, uh, level of success in my view there is a solution and that solution is being explored today by multiple science agencies 
and that is actually a partnership with government agencies even in industry oriented research we should break the norms of funding so that government can more liberally fund research risk research in industry in multiple ways it is already doing that in some areas such as in biotech and vaccine development this needs to be scaled enormously secondly the amount of resources in our academic research ecosystems in our national labs has three components which industry should partner in terms of contributing costs for finding solutions these three components which our national lab and universities have are intellectual power infrastructure and land these three components if they come as their contribution to a partnership industry brings in another third government brings up the third component then we can take on challenging new problems which are both relevant uh, as well as you know uh, competitive uh, globally so it requires a new mindset in the ways we function and i completely agree that entire mindset in terms of you know what one accounts for in terms of outcomes should move in that direction rather than what accounts for in terms of every rupees spent and what is the output thank you very much yeah that, that's a very deep insight indeed uh, nidhi ji uh, is there any other burning question that that you yes sir that, sir there is you know, one we could question. address now yes sir uh, there is just one last question sir yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, uh, which is uh, been asked by everybody and i think it's for all of you i'm so sorry because of uh, internet connectivity something happened and there was a lag on my side i apologize for that this last question comes from a bunch of girls from christ university bangalore and uh, they are right now in the hostel sir Uh, during these pandemic times, Kavita, Rashi, Mithila, all these have been asking, and they're all asking as in to know asking. And I think I would request Dr. Raghu and Sir to answer this question. They say, "Are we prepared for another pandemic? If at all, and when can we start? Uh, you know, looking beyond the new normal because the new normal is certainly not our normal. Exactly the way they've sent the question." I'm asking this to you, sir. So these are a bunch of teenagers who want to know when they can start going out, and uh, whether there is another pandemic coming. And I think since you spoke about that, uh, it is only right to ask you. Thank you very much. The answer is uh, the answer is simple. Um, that, but yet, it's, as always, you know, the solution is more difficult to implement. I will be very brief. But there are three kinds of interventions which will help hugely. One is a non-pharmaceutical one, and these are distancing and having masks. These are important now, and they are important for any pandemic. These are non-pharmaceutical interventions of various kinds. How you deal with your workplace and so on. And a huge amount of relatively normal activity can be taken place if most people. take precautions we can actually crunch this pandemic entirely if most people take these non pharmaceutical precautions if you then slip up then it spreads so this is a huge community responsibility which we can do for this and for any pandemic the second point are pharmaceutical interventions pharmaceutical interventions are those i'm talking about you know drugs and vaccines together drugs are easier to develop but more difficult to develop for viruses in a specific manner they have started coming for late stage illnesses they will come for early stage illnesses also they will not be very specific they will have more side effects and you know we don't know how we will luck out it's very difficult to make drugs against specific viruses because the virus uses our machinery to replicate and therefore a drug will also affect our machinery and when you give a preventive drug to a healthy person side effects are not all the same thing holds for vaccines vaccines are much more effective but much harder to develop and they are much more specific they give us the true exit from the pandemic vaccines normally take 10 years to make and hundreds of millions of dollars today the world is trying to make it in one year for billions of dollars it looks like so far that those effort, efforts Will be successful. So the vaccine exit will come 
late this year and early next year. Given the huge challenges in vaccine distribution, it will take over a year to distribute the vaccines to everyone. Till then, you know, one needs to increase the level of normal life, taking the first set of precautions, which are difficult, particularly for the young, but this is something which we can do and that will give us a safe exit from this. And that's the kind of behavior which will give us an exit from any pandemic. Thank you. So that goes uh, as an answer to all your questions, uh, friends. And uh, you have to stay safe uh, during pandemic times, is what Dr. Ragwan has been saying. And uh, increase workout with your immu immunology and uh, take uh, precautions uh, in the new normal. And hopefully, we'll be back to brighter times, better times. And of course, uh, as he also said, uh, we at DST and the Ministry of Health are trying to compress timelines and it's not easy to make a vaccine. It's not magic. And on that note, we come to an end of this Q&A session. I now request uh, Dr. Nakul Parashar, sir, Director Vigyan Prasar, uh, to please present the vote of thanks. Nidhi ji, if I may just very quickly say something in a lighter vein, uh, because there's a bunch of teenagers, as you said, or, you know, young people. Uh -huh. uh, you see, in the, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, there was a famous saying, it said, only way out is in. So this is also part of new normal. Uh, they say, when will we be out? You see, out, uh, this is a great time to cultivate the inner uh, strengths as well, uh, that we are usually not focused on, on what is called the normal times. And I think this is a time of great growth uh, potential as well. Uh, and so I can explain the meaning of all this if I had more time. But suffice it to say that it offers new opportunities uh, for growth. Absolutely. As you said, we need to look inwards. I now request uh, uh, Dr. Nakul Parashar, sir, Director Vigyan Prasad, to present his vote of thanks, sir. You are muted, Nakulji. Ah, right. On uh, on behalf of NCSTC and Vigyan Prasar, I thank all our esteemed panelists for taking out time to start the DST Ju uh, Golden Jubilee Discourse Series. Thank you very much, sir. I would also like to thank all of you to have joined this uh, webinar and look forward to your participation in our forthcoming webinars and lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And uh, I think the entire credit for this wonderful inaugural goes to you and your team, uh, Nakul, sir. And uh, uh, more, more power to you. And on that note, necessity is the mother of invention, friends. And we have invented quite a few solutions for India. Thank you all for having joined us on this, the auspicious occasion of Golden Jubilee of the Department of Science and Technology. And the very best to you in all your future endeavors. Let us together, you and I, promote science and technology at the state, district and village levels for grassroots development. Let us apply science and technology in every aspect of our life. Let us get real and take it to the next. We are and we that Department of Science and Technology is beautiful, with this, we come to an end of today's inaugural program. And as we formally sign off today and bring the inaugural ceremony to an end, I request all of you to please rise, to please stand up for the national anthem, Jai Hind. भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कड वंगा विंज हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशिष मागे गाहे तव जय गाधा
जनगण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे